This is the um, second edition, we should call it this way, of this CLS FGV Global Alliance workshop, where we have the honor of receiving here at FGV uh, distinguished faculty from Columbia Law School. So I'd like to extend my very warm welcome to Curtis Milhaupt, Robert Jackson, Merritt Fox, Zohar Goshen, Katharina Pister, who's not here, but she will hopefully be here soon and Kate Judge. And um, it's an honor for all of us to have you all here. So I'd like to also welcome my colleagues from FGV and students and um, other special guests who are here this morning. And then with no further ado, I would like to uh, just pass on the mic to Curtis because we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so let me just uh, extend our uh, thanks to everyone. Since I'm the first speaker, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of my colleagues at Columbia. We're really delighted to be here, and as, uh, uh, as Bruno said, for the second edition of this, uh, this workshop, and we hope to continue this and expand it in the future. So, uh, okay, um, let me start. I'm going to present a joint work with uh, co-author Wen Tong Jung, who's at Florida, uh, Levin College of Law. And um, this is, in some sense, a kind of mirror image of a project that I did with a different co-author, uh, Li Wen Lin, last year, which looked at uh, state-owned enterprises in China. And this is part of a perhaps quixotic uh, project to understand Chinese state capitalism. So in this project, we're looking at the impact of state capitalist institutions on private firms in China. And when I talk about private firms or POEs, privately owned enterprises, um, I'm speaking exclusively of large privately owned firms in China, so the Baidu's of the world, not small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Uh, the, the motivation for this paper uh, whoops, is um, what we call the ownership bias. Uh, as this group, group knows very well, uh, ownership is perhaps the defining characteristic of uh, of corporations, uh, ownership is thought to play a tremendously important role in defining the monitoring and incentive structure of firms. There's a very important uh, strand of theory of the firm literature which tees off of ownership. And particularly when we turn to state-owned enterprise and the, the divide between SOEs and POEs, ownership is thought to be crucial in understanding the difference between these, uh, between these firms. Um, when we get to the international economic regulatory environment, uh, ownership plays a tremendously important role. This is a, an area that's relatively new to me, and I suspect perhaps to some of you as well. When we look at uh, global rules on investment, trade, and so on, uh, anti-bribery rules, they all tee off of ownership with special disciplines, as they're known, special sets of rules for state-owned enterprises on the theory that SOEs, but, but only SOEs, have privileged access to the state such that they require uh, special, uh, special rules. The, the key argument in this paper is that um, this ownership bias, if you will, is quite misleading in trying to understand Chinese firms and in trying to understand the impact of state capitalism in China. So in brief, um, the paper argues that the boundary between SOE and POE is very blurry in, in China, so that this, this dichotomy, in some sense, really doesn't make sense um, from the beginning. We also argue, um, somewhat counterintuitively, I think, that the state exercises less control over SOEs than is commonly assumed, but at the same time, it exercises more control over private enterprise. Again, I'm speaking of large private enterprises in China than is commonly assumed. Uh, and in fact, SOEs and POEs in China have very similar relationships to the state, very similar motivations. Uh, why? Because the Chinese state reserves relatively unspecified residual control rights in all uh, enterprises in, uh, in China. And we argue then that Chinese state capitalism is better explained by capture of the state than by uh, ownership of enterprise. Um, I'm going to not spend a lot of time elaborating these claims. Perhaps you've read the paper. If not, you can look at them. I'm happy to elaborate in, in the Q&A. So let me go rather quickly through, uh, through this. Just an example of the basic foundational point that I was making, and it calls to mind the work that Mariana has done about mixed ownership of, of enterprise. Here's a good example of what she's talking about. 
ZTE Corporation, a gl globally active and competitive uh, telecommunications manufacturer, uh, equipment manufacturer, the subject of a U.S. House investigation in the United States. If you look at the ownership structure of the firm, it's hard to tell whether this is, is this a state-owned enterprise? Is it a privately owned enterprise? Here's its ownership structure. You see that uh, the, it's controlled by ZTE Holdings. That holding company, in turn, has a 51% state ownership uh, 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 owned by SOEs, 49% by private firms. So is, it, is this an SOE? Is it, uh, is it a POE? Is it a hybrid firm? There are many, many examples of this where it's simply not clear how a firm should be, should be categorized. So right off the top, it makes one wonder whether a stark dichotomy between SOE and POE really makes sense and whether this, this dichotomy should be driving policy and should be driving the international, uh, these international rules. Well, here's um, a few points on the argument that um, the state actually has relatively attenuated control over SOEs. Simple agency theory would suggest to us that ownership does not necessarily mean control, and there's many examples that suggest that SOEs in China are actually controlled by their managers, not by the state. Um, SO, the central SOEs in China pay very low dividends um, to the government. The, the dividends that they do pay are almost uh, entirely recycled back to them in the form of subsidies. So something like $280 million of dividends were paid by the central SOEs to the government in 2012. 92% of that was recycled back to them in the form of, uh, of subsidies. We see large amounts of unregulated uh, executive compensation in, in SOEs. Again, if the state really is the control, if, this, if SASAC, this is the agency that in theory controls the SOEs, if this is really a controlling shareholder, we would expect them to behave like a controlling shareholder in, for example, in carefully monitoring and controlling executive compensation. At a formal level, indeed, that's what they, they try to do, but the reality is far different, uh, far different from that. I'm happy to elaborate um, that point. And similarly, the government, again, this agency, um, SASAC, seldom, when it tries to influence SOE's behavior in, in China, it seldom acts as a controlling shareholder. It doesn't use standard corporate mechanisms. It doesn't act through the board of directors. If it acts at all, and in many cases, its attempts to modify SOE behavior have failed, and I'm happy to give some examples of that, but where it does try to influence their behavior, it does so as a regulator, or the Chinese state does so, does so as a regulator, not as a controlling uh, shareholder. When we turn to uh, private enterprises, um, we see that the state actually exercises considerable control over large, large private firms in China. So one of the hallmarks of SOEs in China is their close relationship to government bodies. So all of the top managers of SOEs in China simultaneously have positions in the government and with the party. Well, it turns out that the same thing, we called this in this previous paper, we call this institutional bridging just to kind of illustrate this. Well, it turns out that the very same phenomenon is, is operative with large private, uh, privately owned firms in China. We looked at the political connections of the top of the 100 largest private firms in China. 96 out of the 100 top uh, controllers or founders of those firms have extensive political connections as well. Here's a list of the top 10. You see nine out of the 10 have extensive political connections. The only one that doesn't, very interestingly, is Mr. Ren of Huawei. You may, at least in the United States, Huawei is rather infamous. Uh, and it's also been the subject of many uh, uh, investigations and the like on the, on the argument that it is actually a state-owned firm with close connections to the military. So maybe it's not coincidental that Mr. Ren has no public uh, uh, political or party, uh, party affiliations. Um, well, the, the state heavily subsidizes SOEs. It also heavily subsidizes POEs. Here's a list of um, uh, the largest recipients of government subsidies in the year 2010. You see, for example, Geely Automobile, very successful automobile manufacturer, half of its net profits in 2010 came from government subsidies. Um, want Want China is an interesting one. This was actually, when I presented this in Beijing, it was pointed out that this company, number six on the list, is actually a Taiwanese firm. So the Chinese government is subsidizing a Taiwanese firm's operations in, in China. Very fascinating. Probably these subsidies are coming from local governments, and indeed many of these subsidies come from local governments in their bid to spur investment in their, uh, in their regions. Uh, 
there are, there are other arguments we elaborate in the paper. Um, there are industry associations that are quote unquote private, but in fact, um, they are shadow government uh, ministries which exercise extensive non-formal control over these, uh, over these private firms. So the argument, you know, basically stepping back from this is that if we want to understand uh, the impact of Chinese state capitalism, we have to look beyond the state sector, which is primarily the focus, uh, and, and think about capture of, uh, of the state. Um, we suggest that, of course, capture is ubiquitous around the world, but we suggest that the Chinese economy is uniquely susceptible to capture. Why? Because of its enormous size, extensive government intervention, which creates uh, rents that can be captured, and by the relatively weak legal institutions, which make the state quite porous and quite uh, susceptible to being captured by, uh, by firms of all types, whether they are quote-unquote state-owned or, uh, or privately, uh, privately owned. And thus, a key strategy of all large firms in China is, is capture. Um, in the paper, we elaborate a little bit of, a, of the dynamics here, uh, adapting a model from Hellman et al., uh, who used their model to explain capture in the Eastern European uh, economies. They separate out influential firms, SOE incumbents, versus what they call capture firms, which are, in our, in our model, uh, uh, promising uh, SOEs. Uh, basically, the difference between what happened in Eastern Europe and what happens in China, we argue, is that in, in Eastern Europe, private firms, captive firms, liter literally purchased connections to the state. And of course, that happens in China as well. But there's a different dynamic of capture in China, which is the, the potential to grow is so enormously valuable to political leadership in China that if a firm has growth potential, it opens up tremendous avenues of capture of the, of the state. There are many examples of this which I'm happy to, uh, happy to elaborate on. And if we look at patterns of market dominance in China, we see SOEs have captured traditional industries, um, energy and, and the like, whereas large private firms have captured uh, markets involving new technologies where the, firm, where the state was not involved at the outset of the privatization uh, process. Here's a quote that uh, I think is quite telling, uh, again, focusing on local uh, officials and the incentives that they have for their own, uh, their own purposes to, uh, to demonstrate growth to the central government. They don't really care whether a firm is state-owned or privately owned. If it can grow, um, it, it merits and it, it receives large amounts of state largesse in order to, uh, to promote that, that growth. Um, so if we're, if we're right about this, or at least not completely wrong about this, it would seem to have tremendous implications across a whole variety of, of dimensions. Um, theoretically, uh, again, hearkening back to, to Mariana's work on mixed ownership, um, it suggests that state capitalism, at least in China, but perhaps elsewhere, um, one of the key impacts of state capitalist institutions is to dilute the impact of, of ownership and to open up avenues for mixed ownership strategies of, of the sort that we don't necessarily see in more market-oriented economies. Uh, for Chinese economic reform, much of the debate and discussion has really focused on shrinking the state sector. Well, if our argument is, is correct, then the private sector needs as much institutional reform in China as, um, as the state sector to create truly neutral institutions in the areas of antitrust, capital market access, and the like to uh, to change the incentive structure for, for firms, to move them away from capture dynamics to uh, uh, consumer surplus uh, and, and the like. Um, I'll end very soon. Just let me skip over global trade and investment and just jump right down to, to law and just give one example of where I think this, what we call the ownership bias, may lead policymakers astray. Uh, highly relevant contemporary topic is anti-bribery law. So we have a, a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which says if a U.S. firm and uh, certain other, uh, certain foreign firms uh, pay a bribe to a go foreign government official, um, they're liable under the statute. People who, employees of SOEs are automatically considered to be government officials for purposes of this statute. Um, it says nothing about people who work for um, private enterprises. So look at the Chinese case. There is an assumption that an SOE is automatically connected to the state in a way that we should be concerned about. While 
automatically privately owned enterprises would be um, beyond the scope of this law. So if the analysis in this paper is correct, that sort of crafting of, of the regulation is, uh, is, quite, is quite misguided. And we give a number of other examples across the board of this phenomenon. So that's the gist of the paper. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's uh, comments and your uh, questions and criticisms. Thank you very much. OK, good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to be here in this, in this second edition of this workshop. Thank you, uh, Mariana, Parjendler, and Bruno Salama, my colleagues, for inviting me again to this, to this workshop. And thank you, uh, Professor Curtis, uh, for organizing again this, this workshop. Uh, <clears throat> this is a fascinating topic. I really like the paper, uh, in particular for me, who has been studying the, the Brazilian state of capitalism. Uh, I could learn much of, of, of China in this, in this paper. And basically, what I'm going to do here is to present some comparisons, or a very brief comparison with Bra the, the Brazilian case of state capitalism. Uh, so I'd like to start explaining, uh, explaining you the title of, my, of, of this presentation, uh, Rule of Lassus. Uh, Lassus is a... Uh, uh, sort of pun with rule of law, uh, that's the, for sure. Uh, in Portuguese, laços uh, means relationship on uh, a network, and perhaps it connotes the same meaning of uh, guanxi in the Brazilian political economy. And guanxi is, is the, the idea of laços in the Chinese uh, perspective. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the claim here is that the institutional foundation of Brazilian capitalism is built on uh, relations, uh, relations, and more uh, is more built on relations than on the on the rule of law and, and the liberal legality, let's say. Uh, and I decided to make this this joke because the main claim of Milhaupt and Zeng's paper is that in China ownership structure is less important than the political connection. That's the, the main claim of the paper. In other words, uh, it would be a mistake to differentiate POEs and SOEs, private owned uh, enterprises and uh, state owned enterprises, based on, only on the type of owner, as far as I could understand. Uh, as Professor Milhaupt, Milhaupt has mentioned, uh, due to the agency problems, the controlling shareholder positions does not, does not guarantee the enforcement of policy decisions in SOEs. Uh, on the other hand, political connections and extra legal controls, I would say uh, industrial policy measures as a whole, uh, <coughs> ensure that government has great influence on private companies as well. So the reason for that uh, relies on the type of capitalism that is prevailing in China and I would say in Brazil as well. And this is the type of state of capitalism or political capitalism to employ Max Weber's expression. And as you know, in this type of capitalism, <coughs> the accumulation, the capitalist accumulation is not driven by individuals coordinated in the market but is driven by political reasons and the political tools in a such a way that the state politicizes uh, the capitalist accumulation. So assuming this type of capitalism as the building block, the paper presents its stronger claim, which is the boundary, of the, the boundary between POEs and SOEs is blurred in China. It's not, it's not possible to distinguish, again, to distinguish this, uh, these two enterprises based on ownership. And, and this finding is a very important one uh, if one take in, takes into account that either for positive reasons or normative reasons, <coughs> these uh, this blurred boundaries uh, matter a lot. For positive reasons, in the sense that it enables a better understanding of uh, Chinese panorama. But for policy reasons, to the extent that it poses important challenges for different uh, areas, as it mentioned in the paper, such as uh, courts uh, in the in the antitrust cases or the regulation of FDI in some countries, and so and so. Um, 
But the paper went further. Uh, it brought very important contributions for comparative legal studies. And as I read the paper uh, through this lens, the comparative legal studies, I will, comment on, I will comment on in making a very brief and superficial comparison between two types of state capitalism, Brazil and the Chinese one. Uh, in the same token that uh, in China, private companies have also great influence of the government in Brazil. And, and here, as in, the, in China, the imagined world of private autonomy should be uh, replaced by the realistic image of an uh, embedded autonomy world, uh, to use the uh, Peter Evans uh, uh, expression, in which private and public bonds are very linked. This slide gives you the ownership structure of Vale, the third biggest company of Brazil. Uh, it's important to, to mention that the Vale, vale is the third one because the two ahead of Vale are both state-owned companies, uh, Petrobras and BR Distribuidora, which is a Petrobras subsidiary, which also confirm, uh, this rank also confirm the existence of pervasive state capitalism in Brazil, in the sense that the two biggest Brazilian companies are state-owned companies. So Vale was an icon, a kind of icon of Brazilian developmental state, and it was privatized in the 90s during the, during the Cardoso government under a fierce opposition from the left, which accused the government of implementing neoliberal policies, market-oriented reforms. However, despite having been privatized in this neoliberal moment, Vale is not exactly the model of a private company or a market-oriented, in, uh, established in a market-oriented uh, reform. Vale, um, if one considers that a private company is a completely independent from the government, this is not the case of Vale. As well as the case of DT, ZTE, presented uh, by Professor Milhaupt, or Pink and the insurance company mentioned in the paper, uh, Vale has also a blurred ownership. Looking to the ownership uh, structure of the value you can find in, in the in the controlling of value uh, BNDES par uh, BNDES has 11 percent of of vale par which is the holding of uh, value uh, <clears throat> second it appears little in this ownership structure but who is exactly little Litel is formed by four, the four more important pension funds of, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that act in, in the Brazilian uh, capital market, Funcef, Petros, Funcesp, Funcesp and Previ. These pension funds are basically institutional investors and their, their resources are formed by the pension of the employees of state-owned state-owned companies. FUNCEF is, uh, is the pension fund of employees of uh, Caixa Econômica Federal, which is a state-owned bank. Petros is, uh, just to mention three of them, of them. Petros is a, a pension fund of Petrobras, employees of Petrobras, and Previ, the biggest one, uh, is from uh, employees of Bank of Brazil, Bank do Brasil, the biggest uh, Brazilian bank, one of the biggest Brazilian banks. So uh, uh, it's, it's very important to note this because nowadays pension funds are the most important institutional investor in Brazilian economy, and they are really influenced by the government, mainly when the Labour Party is in the office. Uh, the other piece of evidence of similarities between Brazil and China is the very important role played by BNDES, the Brazilian Development Bank. Compared to the other source of corporate financing, BNDES is the second most important source of financing in Brazil. Only uh, ahead of BNDES, there is only the retaining, the retaining of earnings of Brazilian companies. Uh, according to Milhaupt and Zhang, in China, subsidies to a large, fast growing, I'm, call, I'm calling uh, Professor Milhaupt. In China, subsidies to large, fast-growing private firms are widespread and can constitute a significant portion of companies' net profits. I would say that this is the same in Brazil. You can see in this, in this chart that BNDS, the gray area of the, of, the, of the chart, 
is the second most important uh, source of corporate finance. Uh, the, white, the white area is the returning of earnings. Uh, equity and debit are much less important than BNDS in, in terms of corporate financing. So uh, this is a huge development bank last, last year or in, in, the, in the last years. It burst like $100 billion in the economy in one year. It is like three times bigger than the, the World Bank. Uh, it is a very important uh, player in the Brazilian, in the Brazilian economy. Uh, but if there are several similarities in, in the last quotation, uh, uh, in, in this comparison, this last quotation that, again, subsidies in China, subsidies to large, fast-growing private firms are widespread, according to professors Milhap and Zhang. Uh, this quotation introduced uh, some differences as well. According to Milhap and Zhang, the most important criteria to support private companies is not the ownership, but the growth potential of the company uh, in China. Uh, the way either private or state-owned companies can be supported if they, uh, if they, uh, the, the criteria to support state-owned companies or private-owned uh, uh, private company uh, is related to its potential in the, in the, Chinese, uh, in the Chinese company. I would say that, uh, the Chinese government is, is picking the winners or, or, or forming the winners in the, in the Chinese uh, economy. That's the reason why large and fast-growing companies receive great support. This is a kind of mercantilist uh, option of, of, uh, of regime. But if you want to look to the Brazilian panorama, it's true that we share most of these aspects of chronic capitalism, but the results are relatively different. I would say the difference is not about the substance, but also the performance. Going back to BNDS, one can find uh, one can find that greater part of its disbursement have been uh, allocated to commodity sector and not exactly to fast-growing companies in in, in high-tech sectors. In other words, the Brazilian industrial policy presents, I would say, a Ricardian profile uh, and not exactly a Schumpeterian profile in the sense that it, it, is more, it, it more confirms than transforms the standards of Brazilian comparative advantages. The, this curve, the, the most prominent curve is the commodity sectors, as you can see in this, uh, in this graph. Uh, this table also confirms this information. The five biggest disbursements of BNDS since 2008 have been uh, allocated to more traditional sectors like commodities, meatpack, uh, meatpack sectors, uh, uh, telecom but telecommunications not, in, not to, to produce, uh, uh, not in the same sectors as ZTE, but the, the public utility sector are, I would say, what else? Uh, pulp and paper. I would say that the second industrial revolution of, of Brazil. In other words, <clears throat> this sector has less value added. Besides this, the number of patents required uh, in US PTO reveals these different trajectories. China seems to emulate other Asian tigers, as John Honest Sort claims in the very famous paper, while Brazil lagged behind. Uh, if you if you see in this in this uh, in this table, you can see that the number of patents required by Brazil uh, went from 53 to 200 and something. Uh, if you compare to China or even even uh, to South Korea and Singapore, the the, uh, the Chinese competitors has been uh, has becoming uh, has been becoming what Alice Ames then. Uh, uh, because uh, they are maker of, tech, uh, of technology, while the Latin Americans have become uh, the buyers of, of technology. So basically, that's the difference between the two types of state capitalism. We are not going ahead in the, to this, toward the, th the third industrial revolution. We are, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, stopped in the, in the in the, second, in the second industrial uh, revolution. Uh, even the company, uh, even the, the company example, uh, whose structure I opened this, this debate, confirmed this point, that Brazil has been able to succeed in the second industrial revolution, but not in the third. Uh, 
Uh, while Milhaup and Zhangs illustrated the Chinese case with DT ZTE company, which is acting in telecommunication, my example was about Vali, a company that explores iron ore. Uh, and and uh, iron ore is the second, uh, the third company uh, in the Brazilian panorama. These are only two examples, to, just to conclude, that illustrates the huge differences uh, that have been prevailing between Brazil and China. China grows approximately 10% a year, Brazil less than 2%. China has been able to establish important brands around the world. Brazilian companies has di have been difficult uh, in becoming global players. So reading this paper, I read the impression that while China has been able to employ the state capitalism in a flourishing way, Brazil has had only timid results. That's the... So, uh, my, my final question is, uh, I'd like just to, to conclude my presentation uh, uh, asking a question. So taking account uh, uh, the successful case of China and the less successful case of Brazil in the state capitalism, I wonder in what extent and under which scenarios uh, the political connections of state capitalism can replace in a, uh, in a sexuatory way the incentives provided by the property rights and the engine of market economy? Or can we assume that Chinese gave, gave, uh, gave birth to the new way of mercantilism that will compete against the liberalism uh, around the world? Or the Brazilian case suggests that mercantilism and the developmentalism will be always a second best. Is this China uh, case, uh, this, uh, is this China case a permanent ex 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 exception or only a transitory successful case? So basically, uh, if we assume that liberalism and mercantilism will be the two uh, uh, opponents in the, in the future of the capitalist economy, uh, can I assume that mercantilism is the second best or will, will, will compete against liberalism in a in a very good shape. So thank you very much. OK. So um, we have this extremely rich paper by Curtis and another very, very rich and thought-provoking uh, comment by Mario. And I'm sure many here have comments. And uh, we, we should definitely make time for you know some discussion. And yet we have to you know sort of like sort of beyond schedule. So um, let's do this. Let's have a round of comments, and then Curtis um, reacts to the comments. Um, Mariana? I was anxious to get to get in line, because I, I really absolutely love this paper. I might be a little bit biased, because I, um, I really like the, the topic of state ownership uh, in general. But, but, but I really think um, uh, the paper is so full of insights and food for thought. So I just wanted to throw some some ideas and, and, and hear your your reaction. So um, so of course you're right that we, we tend to think of this big distinction and you show the the distinction is not so sharp. But then my, my reaction to that is that well, why would it be right in countries where you don't have a rule of law and you don't have property rights? Why would that make a difference? Um, so, but then, but that, but that thought actually creates a puzzle because, in fact, and I think it might be a puzzle worth exploring, which is the fact that in those countries you actually have a whole lot of state ownership. So, if state ownership doesn't matter because the government can control both state-owned and companies and privately owned companies, then why do you need um, state-owned companies? Um, so, 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 so then uh, I just so some thought. I mean, are they really perhaps complementary? Do you have um, a market versus hierarchy story? I mean, SESAC is so large that by now we can no longer control the economy, so maybe um, uh, uh, one-shot trades with private companies are, are better. So is, it, um, uh, so, so is, is that um, a, a, a transaction cost story, maybe, um, for, for this, um, um, both the presence of state ownership and the, then the declining distinction between state ownership and private ownership, and 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 also um, another uh, possibility would be maybe the one I have favored in the past is that maybe state ownership has uh, 
a negative impact on the institutional environment. And the more discretion you give to the state through ownership, then the state can control things. Uh, um, uh, they con can control private firms as well. So would that be um, a reasonable um, reaction? And just thinking, uh, I mean, there's so many uh, parallels uh, to Brazil. Uh, I, I don't want to take too much uh, time uh, on it right now. We can we can talk um, uh, more about that later. But uh, also, uh, in some cases, though, um, I think Mario's um, example of Valley, which is a very prominent example, uh, it still has some differences because the state is a minority shareholder, so you still have some ownership, and and therefore mm -hmm. it's still the influence of the state is still more within within um, the rule of law. But in other policies, that's not so clearly the case. For instance, the Brazilian government has this idea of promoting national champions, and some of them are private firms, really private firms. And then, of course, the idea must be that, that a private firm must be able to promote governmental objectives. It doesn't always play that way. Perhaps Brazil have, has a stronger rule of law, a very famous merger, supposed to create a national champion in um, be in beers, <laughs> uh, it, it ended up. Uh, it ended up. Um, uh, the result was that the firm was then sold to a foreign investor, and well, still has some links to the government. But um, uh, so, so basically, those are, are are my initial thoughts. And it it, it seems to me that Brazil would be um, at some point in a continuum. Uh, some of the uh, channels for governmental influence are slightly more legalized than 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 in China. Well, Curtis, I think this is a really neat uh, paper. I'm trying to think through, in terms of the Chinese example, um, kind of what the implications are for the generation of uh, of innovation. Um, I mean. At one level, it seems like a clever system if you want a fair amount of government control, right? Sort of an incub a private incubator uh, followed by the, uh, the government harvesting the, the more successful um, uh, firms that were started by, by private <laughs> persons. But I'm trying to think through what, a, you know, what, what does that regime do in terms of the incentives to be an innovator and, and form a private firm, and you could say, well, actually, this is great. You know, if you if, if you're successful, then you'll get subsidies and so on. But obviously, there's only so much to go around. It means there are other innovators who, in a in a in a liberal economy, would have gotten resources in a private economy that 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 don't here. So there may still be a, an aspect of of confiscation. Um, that could discourage innovation. So, and this kind of, I think, builds off Merritt's comments, which is a little bit what happens in a dynamic environment. So you get subsidies at time A. Maybe that's really good to incentivize innovation prior to time A, but once those subsidies are awarded, how does that change the playing field going forward? But I actually feel like you're also raising another really interesting dynamic, which is we often talk about it in terms of the state, both in terms of the ownership interest, but also in terms of subsidies. And so I think particularly in the subsidies, we think about that, how that changes the playing field on an international basis when you're getting kind of state-based subsidies. But what you're pointing out is actually the effect of those subsidies in terms of the incentives and the, the long-term effects are very different when they're coming not from the federal government, but if you have a federalist system for one of the states within it, and then we actually have to look at what are the incentives of those states. So in the US, you probably get all kinds of state-based incentives, I think, for jobs. They want local job creation, so they give incentives if they think there's gonna be job creation. Here, it sounds like there's actually an interest in growth at that <coughs> level, so that the growth ends up being, or the potential for growth ends up being what's rewarded. So I feel like it's just, again, so rich, but one of the things I would love to like, like think more about is what is, how, how do we think about subsidies in the context of a federalist system? I, I like to refer to the question that Mario left us with, and it seems as just the term state ownership doesn't mean the same, even though we used to think about state ownership as the same thing. And there is some irony here. Maybe state ownership, when the state is a democracy, operates completely different than when a state is not a democracy. Maybe the ability to have long-term planning, maybe the, the fact that you are not contestable on, in your regime and you know that the, the contest would come maybe 
in a delay and not necessarily in a vote in a, every four years or five years, whatever the system is. So I think that there is this element that need to be explored uh, in order to, to, to fine tune how is that, that what we consider to be state owned, it's still successful. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously fascinating. And one, one of the things that it reminds me of in this sort of new generation of people doing comparative studies on China um, is trying to get past some of these traditional categories that have sort of boxed in the analysis. So also Don Clark has a paper that he's working on right now on, on property rights reform, where a lot of what he says is people are so obsessed with the idea, is it private property? Is it public property? But really, like at some level, you have to look at how it functions. So I think this really contributes to getting past uh, these types of uh, dynamics. But I think one of the interesting things that you can see as it plays out here is people's interpretation of this model as a good or bad thing, right? Um, and so just very briefly, because there's so many uh, great comments here. So if you take like a, the view that this is pernicious, right? Even going beyond your analysis uh, in like, let's just take the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. People could say, well, what really, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't consider state-owned enterprise, you know, employees to be officials. This is the every Chinese company. Really, it's like the distinction doesn't cut against, you know, the fact that they exist in a more sort of properly incentivized environment is that all Chinese companies are compromised. And you can see this discourse in, uh, in countries that have a negative view of this, right? This would be the U.S. or uh, uh, potentially uh, Europe. On the flip side, right, then there are countries, and this is the context of the discussion about like the Beijing consensus, right, that sees this as a powerful alternative and positive model that's been successful. Um, so in this case, uh, in, in the paper, you talk about the idea that the fact that, uh, you know, Chinese you know, companies operate this way seen as a cost because it might make investors sort of wary. But then there's a whole range of people who would say like, well, actually the fact that even private Chinese companies have this type of potential state support is a positive thing, right? And you can see this in like the debate about China and Africa, right? There are certain types of investors that are very happy that it operates this way and actually see it as preferential to just investing in a private company that may, or allowing access to a private company that may just be subject to the whims of the market in, in, in a broader sense. Um, so that's, that's two ways in which the interpretation of whether or not this is a, a model that's inherently flawed or one that's potentially uh, something to emulate can have implications for how does this cut as far as uh, its implications in, in doctrinal and also just in investment behavior. So I just add one thought uh, briefly, Curtis. You've already got some very insightful comments. Um, Something, um, I'm glad you're doing this work in this area in part because we really don't have a good understanding of how these mechanisms work uh, in China. And I guess one thing I saw in your previous paper in this area and that I see going on here is your intuition that um, the mechanisms for state control, for state influence over private enterprise sort of can be broken down into two different categories. There are some formal methods of state control. And you'll always, whenever you do one of these papers, you'll tell us how that works. Well, this entity owns this much and this one. But then you always share with us this intuition that it's not clear to you that that's the important way the state moves the ball as an owner. It might actually be informal channels where they make most of the, where they're able really to, to influence the private enterprise. And maybe it's not this paper, but I wonder if at some point in your study of this area, you want to start thinking about systematically, is there a way we can think of when a state will choose a formal mechanism of control? For, and for what kind of private enterprise it might make that choice, and where it might choose more informal methods of control, and what kind of institutional dynamics tend to uh, tell us whether and how a state will go about uh, exercising control over a state-owned enterprise. Just, I just would like to make a very brief comment. Um, and that has to do with the parallels between the capitalismo de lassos and the state capitalism. Um, I, I, I think it overstates the similarities and undermines a few of the important differences. Um, and I, I wouldn't have the data here, but it, so it's more sort of an impressionist um, observation. Um, but I think that it, once you focus in companies such as Vali, for example, so w which is a company that was just privatized, that, that does make a difference because, you know, it used to be a, a public company, but even within the previously public companies, you find differences. So I don't think that the governance in Valley is exactly the same as the one in Embraer, although I don't know the details, our avi aviation company. So, so even within the former uh, uh, public uh, companies, state-owned companies, those that were privatized, 
perhaps you know if you pinpoint those where the state influence is bigger then you might end up with a picture that really sort of portrays Brazilian capitalism as more uh, more st state capitalist th than what it really is uh, the second point is I think there is a difference uh, well there are several differences but one of them is that I think there is a, a different trend so if you look at China, as far as I understand, the uh, reforms that are b being put in place now are slowly, or perhaps not so slowly, or rapidly moving towards enhancing the notions of private property and sort of disentangling the state from private enterprise. Because if I understand correctly, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, every company was just public, period. And now you have private owned enterprises that are still inf heavily influenced by the state. Perhaps the difference between those and the public owned company is not that big, but still, you know, as Mariana says, that there, there, th this has to mean something, right? Um, and and so, so they have a, one trend, but here in Brazil, I think that the, the trend we're sort of experiencing, it, and that has a lot to do with our politics, is that we're you know, we're sort of, we have a, cert we have a party in government that is really in awe with the with the with the Chinese system and to some extent trying to emulate it and to emulate it very much in the sense that you know you you don't need the governance through law and judiciary power you can have the the governance as much as possible inside the party and then the you know obviously the the political uh, the political in impulse for that will be to colonize the state as much as you can so that you have really your own people inside the government and then you can basically as much as you can do the governance inside the party. So, and this is, you know, exactly what happened in Venezuela. So we do have, we do see a clash of ideas in this country and I think that we are moving towards, you know, sort of emulating the Chinese model at least to some extent. Now, it all boils down at the end of the day to what, you know, Jeb was saying. Is it is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And and, and, and you know this this is really why this issue is such a hot topic here when we talk about governance in China you know some people will look at it and say oh that's wonderful let's try to do that whereas people such as myself will say well that, that might be good for China who has still a per capita income that is exactly half of Brazil's but we are you know a mid middle income society and perhaps that you know it's something that we can look at it with curiosity but if we were to emulate anybody, we should be rather emulating the Europeans or the Americans rather than the Chinese. It's not a comment, but just two points to both. <coughs> what would happen if uh, we change the word capitalism? That is very difficult to do, define to market economy in both papers because they are different things. And uh, the other point is, how about the background history about the situation that we have now? For example, uh, in Brazil, I don't know much about China, but in Brazil it would be very difficult to make uh, the privatization without the uh, pension funds, without the BNDES financing heavily. So I believe that we must we should think about a problem in behind that is the lack of savings. Uh, to myself, it's very difficult to compare uh, um, the market economy between uh, uh, UK or US and Brazil. If I will have a look around the world, we will see that we have uh, strong markets, strong savings in the UK, civil, uh, in UK colonization. Uh, part of Canada, UK, part of Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand. But in the rest of the world, this sort of um, capitalism or uh, market economy is completely different. So we have a very strong cultural and historical background that, as far as I can understand, is not easy to compare uh, those differences. Uh, 
So really, I just want to say thank you for a tremendously rich set of comments. Um, let me just, I'll just address one of the, the major <coughs> themes which ran through this, which is the, you know, the good or bad question. Uh, our, our, our approach in this paper and really the, my entire attempt to make sense of the Chinese system is really just that, an attempt to make sense, to try to understand how it works. And I think before we can really even begin to address the question of good or bad, we need to understand how it's functioning. And I'm, there's very little work being done in this area. So it's, it's encouraging that, that people find this work interesting and that um, uh, because it does give me some motivation to keep at this. It's a very complicated system and it's very difficult to make sense of it. And I've had to use co-authors to do it. But I, I think I would be very reluctant based on what I know about the Chinese system to this point to um, to argue that it's a system that can be or should be emulated by, by other countries. I think there are tremendous problems with the Chinese system as it's structured. Merit started to allude to some of them. Uh, I think the incentives here are, are tangled and they're not necessarily headed in the right direction. I think the, the state is absorbing, um, or the state is misallocating capital uh, in egregious ways in, in China. Uh, eventually, the market will take its revenge on, on this, I think. Um, uh, I think down the road, China faces many governance problems. And Bruno, I think I like the way you put it in terms of trying to govern within the party. Uh, I, had, I actually had no idea that that was um, a, a relevant thought or prevalent thought in, in Brazil. I think there are tremendous problems with trying to govern anything, particularly a large country uh, in, that, in that way. So my initial response is you know, uh, to not leave the impression that I think that this is uh, necessarily a good system or one that, that should be emulated. I don't think it could be emulated because precisely for, for the reasons that you mentioned, this is so tied up with path dependence, history, ideology, and so on. It has worked quite well in China for 20 or 30 years, but you know we thought the same thing of Japan in the 1980s. Everyone thought that Japan had this incredibly new model that was going to take over the world. Their firms were globally active and competitive. Well, what happened? Uh, you know, eventually, there was a very severe financial crisis. The, the misallocation of capital, the weak governance institutions that had been latent suddenly you know, came to the fore. And um, you know, as Yogi Berra, if you know Yogi Berra, but a, a famous saying is that uh, you know, predictions are always uh, hazardous, especially when they relate to the future. Uh, and uh, you know, so, but you know, one prediction I would hazard here is that China faces a lot of challenges down the road. And we don't, its governance system, such as it is, has not been severely tested yet. And so we'll see. Um, once it is, but anyway, yeah, that's all I'll say. There's so many things to respond to, um, but I just, you know, again, thank you so much for for this great set of uh, of comments.